Hey, on this week's episode of 90 Degrees, we take a look inside the sharpest book in Las Vegas, Circa Sports. We find out how and why they move their lines, do they model their openers, and how to spot when a better is trying to head fake the market. That and more on today's episode of the 90 Degrees Podcast. Welcome to the 90 Degrees Podcast. I'm your host, G-Stack George, where we give an inside look into the sports betting industry. And honestly, the first episode was a success. I heard a lot of great feedback, and I want to keep pushing with great episodes. That's why my next guest is someone who works for the sharpest sports book in Las Vegas. His name is Jeff Davis, Assistant Sportsbook Manager at Circus Sports. Jeff, thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me, George. Jeff, I always I always ask people, what was your first introduction to sports betting? Maybe not when you made your first bet, but when you heard about the concept of betting on sports. So when I was in high school, I, I'll say junior year, uh, I worked at an indoor baseball facility. Uh, and there were like some co- local college players that would come and work out or help run camps and things like that. And you just kind of, you know, they bet, you talk about it, and then you just you just end up getting involved as somebody like me who like I loved all sports and I loved competition. So sure. Let's bet. Um, pro- yeah, I was probably like junior year of high school when I first, ma- well, you know, when I made my first bet and then it was, you know, that was the end of it for me. It was from there on. And, uh, do you remember what you bet on and who you bet it with? Like, did you, you had a local bookie, was it offshore back in the day? And, and what was it you were betting on? No, I, it was a Monday night football game. I remember, um, gosh, I want to say it was the Steelers. I don't remember who they're playing or what the number was, but you know, it was like 20 or 30 bucks. And, you know, I just called like the, the guy, like the college kids that I worked with. And I was like, Hey, can you get this bet in for me? And they did. And like, it's just kind of like, it was more of a once in a while thing at that time. Cause I mean, you're a high school kid, you don't have any money, so you can't really bet. So no, it was just like a fun introduction to the whole world that is sports betting. And it, you know, as you get further along in your life, you realize how little you knew uh, back then. Uh, the all important question is, do you remember if you won or lost your first bet? Oh, you absolutely, I absolutely won. I mean, doesn't <laughs> everyone course. win their first bet? Like, everyone wins their I first won. and then they go through a, an immediate losing streak after when reality yeah. hits them how hard this is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the the vig catches up for sure, especially when you really don't know what you're doing. I heard you uh, played poker as well. Do you, do you remember how you got into poker when it was? No, you know, I used to like to go to the casino and just, essentially shred money because I just wanted to gamble when I was you know, 21, 22. And then I had a buddy that, you know, we go play poker and you can spend all day. And if you lose, it takes you eight hours instead of eight minutes. And so I just started messing around playing low stakes cards for a few years. And then as somebody that has always been competitive, I wanted to get good at it. I was like, I enjoyed it. And I played cards like with the family growing up, playing like cribbage and pitch and games like that. So I was like, well, there's got to be a way to beat this because you're playing against other people. And so I just did a lot of reading. And then you learn like I started playing a lot of Omaha High Low because it was more. While all poker is math, that game was like extremely math and mechanical, uh, which is more my thing. So I just uh, yeah, I just started playing Omaha High Low and I realized like while the variance was insane, it was just a really good game that, you know, a lot of people would play in that had absolutely no idea how to play it. So that's just kind of where I, uh, I just kind of evolved from playing, you know, casino table games to, to playing poker. And that was, geez, I was probably 21, 22. And then I, I probably play a casino table game once every 12 to 18 months now like oh let's just play craps for the sake of it but just like never now i went from always wanting to play to never wanting to play well i want to actually talk about that uh but you're you talk about evolving from cribbage like for me it was like euchre and gin and hearts and spades and i loved the concept of finding a game finding an edge and playing like perfect strategy the ideal way to maximize your dollars what when did you you weren't born in vegas when did you move out there um, I'm from Massachusetts. I ended up there in November of 2005. So I'm almost 20 years here now. And 
guy was probably playing poker for like professionally for like a year before I came out. And then I did it for like another year uh, here. And then I made some terrible life decisions and shredded most of my money. So that's when I started working at like the end of 2006. In 2005, like that's heart of the poker boom, right? Like was Vegas uh, on fire at that moment, like back in 2005? Yeah, the games are like really good. And there was, you know, so I was playing mostly Omaha high low. So I could play at the, there was a game at the win and there was a game at the Orleans, like that went almost all the time. And occasionally they'd get like a 2040 limit game going at the Bellagio during, like if there was a world poker tour event, it was like the greatest game in the world because you'd get the 30, 60 hold'em list was so long that people didn't want to wait, you know, two hours to get in a game. So you get a bunch of Hold'em players in a, in an Omaha game. And it was just, it was just so good for, you know, the year I did it. And then, you know, it just, I just moved on from poker and you get into the working world. And now I actually couldn't tell you the last time I played poker. I have absolutely no idea. I'm going to say, got at least 10 years since I've sat at the poker table. I just don't have time. You have to be able to like, when you sit in a game, you have to be able to shut your life off for as long as you're going to sit there. And if the game is good, you're just going to sit there and, you know, wife doesn't matter. Daughter doesn't matter. Job doesn't matter. Like you just play. So I've just got to the point where I can't do that anymore. Can you talk about like the shift in mindset? Because like a lot of people I've heard who work in sports books, they were once like very into sports betting and, into gambling themselves. Like right now in Vegas, the world series of poker is happening right now. So there's obviously a buzz going on in the city. How do you shut off the love for sports betting and poker into, you know what, now it's a job. I no longer want to do that aspect of it. It's like, you're just kind of, you're doing it for somebody else instead of doing it for yourself. Really? I mean, my life hasn't changed in terms of how many, hours of effort I'm putting in every day. Like, yeah, if I'm only in the office for seven, eight hours a day, that doesn't mean I'm not scouring through Twitter or tinkering with some Google sheet that I have or whatever at home. So like, even when I'm not there, I'm still there. So, you know, our, like putting in hours has never been a challenge for me. Like I, it's just what I do. So really I'm just kind of going for grinding for myself versus grinding for someone else. But, you know, you're doing it for a paycheck versus, you know, wh- whatever you win gambling. I, I mean, now that I've done this for so long, I, I couldn't imagine going back to like the professional gambling side and, and trying to like the mental challenges of fighting through like the, the low side of the cyclical streaks that gambling has is, is really tough when you don't have a paycheck coming. Got it. Uh, you know, often gamblers say it's not just about the money. Oftentimes it's like the problem solving aspect. It's the beating, you know, the gamesmanship of it. It's the validation of it. Do you get some of those same thrills uh, being a bookmaker and, and setting lines and doing really well? Like, do you do, do you have you filled that uh, adrenaline that you get on the other side of the counter now? Yeah, like. I wouldn't use the word adrenaline, but definitely it's a game to where, you know, you're trying to get somebody to bet a number. Like if you open a number early that, you know, let's say the market's not really up yet, you're like first to market or at least you're first of a place that'll take a real bet to market. Trying to get somebody to bet something and then have it go like come back to your number to where they're not actually um, getting a good price. Like, if you hang a baseball, like if you hang a college baseball game, if the world has like 11 and you just hang nine, because you know, that's the number yeah, you're going to get bets over nine and over nine and a half from scalpers. And then when it closes eight and a half, it makes you feel like that's the goal. Like, obviously it's not really possible in major markets to have that kind of discrepancy, but like in the obscure stuff, it's, it's, yeah, it's, that's like, that's the kind of stuff that you're like, uh, talking about where you're you're trying to find something that you're like i know this is wrong and you can you know when you hang a number at a place that takes a bet you can you can decide who bets what where and when like i can hang a number like all right this is going to get bet in 20 seconds and it does every time yeah you you say you get a job into sports betting 
what was your first job? Like which, which, um, sports book was it? And what was your role there? So when I realized, like I woke up one day and like, I don't know, we'll call it middle of October of 2006. And I was like, ah, I have two grand and no job and I should probably start working. And I don't have a college degree. So, you know, kind of know I have to go the casino route. And then I see that Bally's, uh, is hiring sports book ticket writers. And I'm like, well, I've never worked in a casino before, but I've bet sports my whole life. And I, you know, I used to go to like high lie when I was, you know, 20, 21, whatever. And it was, uh, so I'm familiar with all this stuff. So I went in and interviewed, uh, luckily for me, the guy who interviewed me, who was a supervisor there grew up like 20 minutes from where I grew up. So that just turned into a conversation. So I got hired there and that was, uh, that was my first gig. I started at Bally's like right around Thanksgiving of 2006 as a ticket writer. Now you said, uh, you know, August, you're, you're like, I got $2,000. I need a job. Vegas strikes me a little bit like, uh, Hollywood or LA where a lot of the people there aren't exactly born and raised there. They kind of get there with a dream and an aspiration. And then it's like, all right, how do I fit in? Let me find uh, somewhere to build a career path. Do, are, are, do you find that, uh, or do you think your situation is unique or do you think a lot of people went to Vegas with a dream and aspiration and then maybe said, Hey, maybe I need to shift shans here and, and get a, get, get a job within the industry. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine, like it's gotta be pretty common because here, like there's so many walks of life. There's so many jobs, like a, there's so many casinos and there's so many roles in a, a casino that, if you come here and you don't end up like not necessarily thriving, but like if you can get a job and like, you know, live a decent life, if you can't do that, then like it's really on you. Um, there's just so much opportunity out here. Now, I can't speak for it now just because I've kind of more established in my career. So I don't really know what that type of job market is in these days compared to 15 years ago. But I mean, just knowing how big casinos are and how many, you know, uh, how many employees these places have, I can I can't imagine it's all that difficult to to find work at a decent place. So you're at uh, Bally's now. You're a ticket writer. How long are you there? And then what's your next move from there? So I, I wrote tickets for probably, I don't know, I think through like the NCAA tournament. And then I was like counter supervisor from like, we'll call it April of 2007. And then when the economic crash hit in 2009, they closed the Bally Sportsbook for the summer. So me and a couple others got laid off. Uh, I worked at the World Series of Poker cage for the summer. And that got me like back into playing poker again because I was just around it. And so I was like, you know, I didn't have a wife and a kid at that time. So I was working and then going to play and then just doing it over again for like three months. And it was fun. But uh, I was happy to get back to the sports book job once, you know, once the fall and football rolled around, they reopened, they hired me back. Um, so I stayed, uh, I was at Bally's until uh, I left to go to the M Resort and Cantor Gaming in uh, October of 2010, I believe. Were you ticket writing there as well, or did you have a different title by the time you got well, there? Well, I, when I went there, it was funny, uh, boss was like, all right, we got a thousand people that want this job. If you want this job, you start Friday or, or we'll hire somebody else. And it was like, it was like Tuesday. And like, I'd been with Bally's for four years and I was friendly with the boss. And I like, it was a terrible phone call to make, having to call my, you know, a guy that I'm still friendly with and be like, hey, here's my 48 hour notice. Like, it's kind of shitty, but it just was the situation that I needed to do. And no, I wrote tickets for like a few months and then... Uh, Cantor was expanding. So they opened uh, Hard Rock, Tropicana, and Cosmo, all like in a relative short period of time, somewhere in the vicinity of Christmas 2010. Uh, so they sent me, I was like the the man, the operations manager at Tropicana for like almost a year, but they knew that that's not like, I'm not an out front guy. Like sure. anybody who knows me knows that nobody wants me talking to customers. Um, so I just, uh, they called me down to go work at the M like in the, 
you know, in the risk department to start the 2011 football season. So it was, you know, just, you know, what, late August of, of 2011, I, I went there and that's when I started. That was my first uh, job, like behind the screen, so to speak. All right, before we get back to the pod, I want to talk about our sponsor, Pinnacle. Pinnacle is the world's sharpest sports book and available to bettors in Ontario. Find out what professional bettors have known for decades. Pinnacle is where the best bettors play. Must be 19 plus in Ontario. Please play responsibly. Not available in the U.S. And now back to the show. Who teaches you like how to you know manage risk and how to trade and how to set lines? Did you have a mentor uh, within the industry at this point? Did someone teach you the ropes? No. And working at that place, especially knowing what, what went on now, like nobody was teaching you anything. You had to learn for yourself. Um, you, you know, like Colbert was really sharp and, and he had leans and he would leave it like he'd be in his office and we'd be out front. And he'd leave us the leans for like when he was out of the office. But for the most part, it was just like learning yourself and trying to piece together, like watching the bets come in and like watching him move. And you still didn't really know like what was right and what was wrong because you haven't had anybody tell you what was right and what was wrong. You just had to figure it out. And then, uh, you know, all the stuff went down with Pinnacle, uh, uh, we'll call it October of 2012. And then the four of us that were under him were just – basically left to run the place with no leadership. Um, and we had like, Colbert was doing so much, we really didn't do a lot ourselves. So it was like total trial by fire. And of course, the month that it happened was like the worst month in Nevada sports betting. I don't know history, but it was close. There wow. was a November where like nine of 10 college football, the top 10 teams in the college football, like nine or 10 of them covered every week for four straight weeks. And the books <laughs> got absolutely massacred. So that didn't obviously didn't make us look good. It was like bad timing and we didn't know what we're doing. So it was a total disaster. Um, and then it, it, they hired Tony D Tommaso, who's a guy who was at uh, Will Hill um, and he ran CG for a while. And he actually, taught me a lot of the fundamental stuff, um, you know, about the why you do things and why you move this way and that way. And then I could take some of what he taught me and then like some of what I watched from Colbert and kind of, cause you can kind of make your own decisions as to what are right is what are wrong. Like the math is always right, but there's not, you couldn't write a manual about how to make book, like not all two, no games are the same, like it's, you got to kind of wing it, figure it out a lot of times, but so you can, if you can pull from a few people's, like the way they do things, you can usually find something that fits for you. You know, you said two things there that resonated with me, like the idea of first time you're swimming alone and like you're getting your, your teeth kicked in because every, every uh, public favorite is, is winning in big droves. We had a, a radio station in Toronto. That opens up in 1994, first ever talk radio station across Canada. And 1994 happens to be like baseball strike, hockey strike, and the Raptors don't exist yet. So basketball is not a huge market in Toronto. And it's like, what a debut. Like your first three months, you have nothing to talk about because everybody's on lockout. And, and it's kind of like that. All right, we, we're going to learn a lot in these next three months because you're either going to sink or swim. The other thing you said is you can know the math and you can know some of the fundamentals, but a lot of bookmaking, it, it strikes me as being feel and art. Uh, I remember Daniel Negreanu used to, used to be asked, why are you so good at reading situations and calling out people's whole cards? And he said, it's not just math. It goes, when you've done it a thousand times, you've developed a, a sort of instinct of like, I've, I've been here before. I've seen this situation before there's overlap. And that, that, is part of uh, his style and why he's so successful at what he does. You you think it's the same for sports uh, uh, line making? I think not so much line making, but booking. Like once you as as the week goes out, like through like you know football games are on the board for the better part of a week. So like limits evolve, information comes out, bets come in, groups play one side, groups play the other, and it's kind of like you spend a lot of the week trying to figure out what 
you know, they're trying to do? Are they betting this total down now so they can get more come game day? And like they're betting under 53 and a half and under 52 and a half and it's going to close 55. Like what happens like quite frequently in like trying to figure out, you, you know, who's doing what and why and and what bets are real and what bets are not. And it, it's I mean, I've booked hundreds of thousands of games and it's still a challenge and I still get fooled sometimes. And that that's inevitable. Um, <laughs> there was a guy who was early in my early in my career. I was at CG and I it was like conference turn uh, conference championship week in a college football. It was Boise State against doesn't matter laying like 23 and a half. And I'm in the office and the number starts to to drift to 24. And we had already had some money on a favorite. And I was like, do I just follow this to 24? Do I stay? And I was like, no, because if I follow it to 24, Billy's going to come in and smash the dog and it's going to close 21 and I'm going to be a fool for going to 24. Well, Billy laid 23 and a half and it went to 27. You could never really write anything back. And, you know, they, they won easy. And it's like the constant decision of like whether to take a bet or at what number is such a challenge. Um, and it's still a challenge. Um, you know, if somebody lays you four in a basketball game and you go to five and the number keeps going to five and a half or six, do you go to five and a half? Do you write another bet at five and a half or do you write the bet at five? Like, do you go to five and a half and then they take five and a half and then you didn't take a bet to get there? That's annoying. Like, so it's, you're making these decisions split second based on the information that's at hand. And it's like, it's not an exact science and just trying to, you know, earn as much as possible as the bookmaker without leaving yourself middled or without leaving yourself get getting like to get run over on one side. It's very challenging, especially in college basketball when there's, you know, 120 games on a Saturday. You know, um, I, I watch the markets diligently, especially in the NFL. So throughout the season, you start to pick up on some tendencies on certain teams move during certain points in the week because obviously there's some sharp groups that end up liking them. Do you pick up tendencies on players and and, and almost anticipate when they're going to come in for a bet and, and what numbers? Do, do you have that instinct or is it always just when it happens, it happens and you react? Well, I mean, you kind of get to know, like Raz tells everyone when they're going to release. So that like, yeah. so you know, when they're playing and then you have like Dr. Bob releasing stuff and like, it's all, you know, like I know we never know when Dr. Bob releases, but we know who the players are that play it. So like, you know, when it's him and like you're following Twitter and you, if you happen to see a piece of news that maybe a better does hasn't seen yet you then have to decide, okay, is this worth anything? And should I move the number or do I want to take a bet at this number? Is it going to move? Um, you know, like in hockey, if I'm watching, like you watch Twitter in the morning for like all the morning skate reports. And then you see that, you know, a semi key player that's worth something to the numbers, not at morning skate. Do you move the number so that you don't get, you don't get bet or do you take the bet or do you hope that, because you're not going to find out if he's actually out or not until maybe after practice or sometimes not until 38 minutes before the game when they take warm up. So like it's always a cat and mouse game uh, with how real you might think the information is. So it's a lot. It's not just seeing bets. It's like trying to get ahead of like the bets that are going to come. Um, like when I was at Caesars trying to explain to executives that don't book games, like, you can't quantify bets that don't come. Like when you make moves and you make good moves, you stop, you stop more bets from coming in. And while somebody that's just looking at a spreadsheet, isn't going to see that bet, but you know, these, there's so many bets that you save by getting ahead of things throughout the year that makes so much of a difference to the bottom line that like, it's, it's totally like a, a lot of the stuff is just a race to information. Sure. You, you notice that a lot of PPHs and, illegal books, they now tend to stake themselves to a sharp book and move while you guys move, whether they take a bet or not. Um, do you think that's um, a smart decision on their part? Or do you think that leaves you a little bit too exposed? Well, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I, there's definitely a few places I see, like there's a couple of places I put on my screen 
that during college basketball because they seem to get the first bets on college basketball totals, like the good bets. So they're on my screen. But I also know that Circa is definitely a big percentage of what they're using as a consensus line because like when when we move like a random event, they move almost all the time. So like it can hurt us at times because like if you want to get a bet, sometimes you can't because you move and then everyone else, like we joke in the office, we call it circus team. So like we can, we can move a line and everywhere moves and we might not have taken a bet. We just might be moving a line for the sake of it, just to watch it happen. Like we've definitely done that before. Um, you know, like what if there are three people managing, uh, the college football markets throughout the week and one person's been off for two days and then he comes in and he goes through the lines and he doesn't like seven of the, where seven of the lines are. So he moves them all. We, we might not have taken a bet and everywhere moves and they have no idea. So we might have taken a bet. Somebody might have come in and made six bets and we might have reacted to them, but we might not have. So it's always like, it's always a guessing game and these places can definitely get themselves hurt by doing that too. So like there's pros and cons, like it's just, it's a running joke in the office. Somebody makes a bet, we move the number and like the whole screen explodes and, and we know like, but you know who's betting and you know, like when certain people make bets, the screen's going to explode. And then like somebody else makes a bet and the screen explodes. You're like, this guy's not betting everywhere. And it, it's it's yeah. kind of funny sometimes. You mentioned Circa. When do you get the call? Um, say, hey, we're building this sports book. We want to cater to sharp betters. Who makes the phone call? When do you get it? Well, I was still at Caesars. Um, Matt Metcalf reached out to me. God, I, I honestly don't remember when, um, but I went down that I went downtown to meet like him, and uh, I think actually I think I went to like meet him for a beer once, just casually, and then like maybe a month later, while Circa was still being built. Like it was really just a big empty plot of land with some steel beams. Um, I went downtown and like met Derek and like in a very informal fashion, there were like 15 or 20 people hanging out, having drinks and like just kind of BSing. So it was like a cool, it was a cool environment to meet him. And like, I knew I was on board and I knew I wanted to go, but given my, you know, we'll call it situation at Caesars, I kind of needed to stay until like the, Caesars Eldorado company merger happened. So pretty much as soon as that happened, I called Matt and I was like, yeah, I'm coming. Like I had to, I gave Caesars like a month notice. And then I got, I started at Circa just before football of 2020. So like coming out of like the COVID pause, I guess, if you want to call it that. Um, So yeah, football of 2020, we'll say. Now, like, did you have a relationship with Matt? Like, or, or was it he had just heard about you through someone else in the industry? Um, both myself and like Matt Lindemann worked for me. And like he was trying to recruit people that he knew, like knew what they were doing. So we kind of both met, you know, we went together to meet him and just chat with him. So like, no, I had never met him before that. But like once we had our first meeting, it was probably, God, it was at least a year before I started working at Circa. Um you know, we stayed in like, we stayed in contact and would like randomly send a text or whatever. Like it wasn't like we're, we were close friends at that point. It was just, uh, it was just kind of like him making him sure, know that like, I still was interested. Um, but I was just kind of, I had to stay where I was at for the time being just for contractual purposes. Sure. Um, so you, you're aware of each other, like you're within the same, uh, you know, atmosphere, the same ecosystem. I come from news media and there's this awful, awfully weird dynamic that when you're away from actual work and you're like out in a social circle, everybody wants to talk about work. I guess when you have certain jobs, you identify as that job and it becomes a lot of your life. Is that what your social life is outside of the sports book? Are you like always in sports book mentality uh or do you completely want to drop it and separate like work and uh, social life completely it depends like it depends on what time of year it is like now 
I have the ability to kind of shut it off because hockey's over. College baseball's about to be over. Golf never ends, but I'm only booking the golf Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Once the golf tees off, uh, we have another guy in the office, Sam Cooney, who we hired like last fall is really sharp with the golf. He works nights and does all the – he does all like the updated odds and the round matchups and things like that. He'll send them to me like and I give him a once over and – you know, I might tinker with him a little bit, but he's doing a lot of the heavy lifting. So once it's just golf, I can kind of take a step back for, you know, six, eight weeks here and relax and spend some more time with my wife and kid, uh, which is enjoyable. But no, like once, like during the season, I can't really turn it off because like if I'm out to dinner with a buddy and, you know, there's a trade in hockey, like it's on me to send it, you know, get in touch with somebody at the office, like, Hey, move this future price, move that, move this, this has to happen. Um, it, it's on me. So I can't really completely turn it off ever, but you know, during the summer when the sports that I manage aren't like in full flight, I can kind of at least take a step back a little bit, which is nice. Do you get burnt out because, so I worked in news media and there was this dynamic where I'd go and watch a movie and there was always a panic coming out of the movie to quickly check to see has the world blown up in those two hours that I was watching a movie. And I could never shake this feeling like first thing I did when I woke up and last thing I did when I went to bed was check what's going on in the world. Is, is that am I describing your situation at all? And does it ever burn you out? Burnt out's not the word I'd use. Um, there are times when you get overwhelmed where like worlds collide in your sports. One example, um, the golf is absolutely, like especially major weeks is absolutely insane how busy it is. And yeah. because of the COVID seasons, the previous couple of years, it kind of changed the off season dates in the NHL. And yeah. last year, NF NHL free agency was the same day as the day before the British Open. And like the Wednesday before majors is like, those are the four busiest days of the year for me. So yep. I actually couldn't keep up with all of the NHL moves. So now I've got to like, it was so overwhelming because now I have to go through every single move that was made and like update all my, you know, update all my Google docs and stuff with all my hockey stuff on it, which if there's no golf that day, I can just kind of do it as the moves come and like it, it kind of takes care of itself. And then once the major week got over, it was like Monday and I'm like, Oh my God, I have, I have hours and hours and hours of stuff to do. And I can't do any preseason hockey, like projections points, any of this until I get all of these guys on their teams. I have no idea who went anywhere. And like yep. situations like that are tough. Like a few weeks ago, you've got, first round of the NHL playoffs region, like getting into the college baseball regionals. And like you get to the point where there's two weeks left in the college baseball season and you're managing the college world series future and all these bubble teams, like wins and losses matter so much to the future pricing. And like, it's just a lot to take in and it just, it naturally happens a couple times a year and you just got to put your head down and grind through it. Yeah. Um, for myself, I only bet uh, NFL football, combat sports, and sometimes political events. I don't get into any other sports. And part of it is uh, I understand the football markets and how they move better. But the other part is is quality of life. I mean, like there's only so much um, hours in your life. And it's not always time to grind and, and uh, try to be making money. There's parts of life where you just want to relax, reset your brain so you don't get burnt out and you're fresh. So much like you, I have a really busy season and then I have a really slow off season where I get to kind of decompress and, and enjoy the other aspects of life a bit. Yeah, I, I've i actually eliminated all betting from my life outside of hockey, golf, and college baseball. Like I... You know, for the last couple of years, I could just grind top down, uh, you know, NFL first half totals, like college, like that kind of stuff. And I could just, I could grind my way in a, you know, two, 3% ROI without any thought, really, just knowing when places are off around key numbers and stuff. But when I get home from work on a Saturday with 
you know, college football going on and you've got a 14 game NHL board I'm booking. I'm doing college football half times. When I get home from work, I don't want to put on Nevada Fresno college football game at 7:30 at night on CBS Sports because I have under 63. I just don't want to do it. And if I have a bet on it, I know me, I'm going to put it on the TV. And I just I just decided that the couple of percent and the little extra money I could make, you know, grinding top down just it wasn't worth it to quality of life. So now it's just like the betting is full go from, you know, preseason hockey through pretty much the end of the regular season and then some hockey series prices and college hockey, like the college baseball rather. Um, but, you know, from now until like September, like I'll make a few golf outright bets on the weekends. But for the most part, like I just don't want to deal with that anymore. And it's just not worth it. I'd rather just shut my brain off. Uh, it's another thing with that. It's like when I do random podcasts or I talk to people or people on Twitter will ask me about in-game stuff. I have no idea. I, I don't bet in-game. My average annual in, uh, handle on in-game is zero. Um, when I, I've i made a bet, I know what the price should be pre-game. I don't know what the price should be with six minutes left in the second quarter and it's 14-7. I have no idea because it's like a whole different world uh, of like learning like what the number should be at what point in the game based on the score is just too much. Um, and I need to turn my brain off at some point. So yeah, I just in game while popular for many is just nothing that I think I could possibly be interested in doing. Jeff, you're like speaking my language. I preach it all the time on the podcast. I just want to enjoy the game. I've already got my action in pre-flop. I'm happy with that. Uh, I don't want to be the guy grinding in front of five different screens live and trying to get incremental edges. And I don't know what what juice is appropriate and what the updated line should be. And then the, the, the only thing I'll do is if there's a major injury and I see it in game like a Monday night football game, Kyler Murray blows out his knee in the second play of the game. I know like my two slowest moving books and I'll pull them up and see if I can take a bite of the apple quickly. But besides that, I just there's a part of me that just wants to enjoy sports because I, before I ever got into sports betting, I was a sports fan. So every other sport outside of football, I watch it from a, a fan perspective and I'm not thinking about trying to grind out, uh, you know, a two, 3% ROI here. Yeah, I can't like, I can tell you with confidence that if I think a team should win 62% of the time pregame, I'm pretty confident in my number. And if I can bet minus a dollar 45 pregame, I'm going to do it. And, but I, I would rather, I feel like if I was constantly with my head in the screen, trying to figure out what live prices should be, I wouldn't actually be watching the game. And I feel like you can pick up tendencies about the way teams play by watching games that, yeah, they don't mean a ton to the number, but if you see something happen in a team's game a few times in a row, it like goes in the back of your mind and it can tinker with a rating you might have or knowing how teams play and knowing that, okay, this is my pregame line, but the way team A plays should be able to, it'll give them a bigger advantage against team B. So maybe the number should be just a little bit higher. Like things like that, if I was grinding live lines, I wouldn't be able to pick up little nuances that happen in games that might make me make like a half a percent adjustment to a number or 1% adjustment to a number. Hey, the easiest way to improve as a sports better is use multiple sports books and always get the best odds. We recommend using an odds comparison tool like BetStamp. BetStamp compares odds across every sports book for games, futures, and player props. Save time and money by clicking BetStamp before you bet. Download the app today. If you are looking to sign up for a new sportsbook account, please check out the offers available at betstamp.app forward slash circles off or hit the link in the description. If you sign up through this page, it helps support the show. Um, I want to talk about Twitter because I think Twitter has changed the world of sports betting forever. Information is instantaneous now. Uh, beat writers, uh, national newsbreakers, they all tweet it out before they go on their own um, companies and, and talk about it in detail. Do you guys have a dedicated guy just looking at Twitter? All like it feels like it'd be worth the salary to pay one guy to sit in front of the screen and monitor Twitter all the time for any news that might be coming in. Oh, well, pretty much anyone that sits in that office has a tweet deck open at all times. And like 
we kind of each person like a few of us are specialists where you know i manage the hockey chris bennett manages the baseball like everybody kind of has sports they manage and it's like on you to be following like what you need to follow and then there are some guys that like they might based on the schedule like okay they might have this sport today that sport tomorrow they're like they're responsible for whatever sport they're booking and like you kind of know like especially like i don't do any nba at all but i know like the back-to-back thing and you know these guys are going to be resting so if it's like golden states on a back-to-back you're going to have a tweet deck uh, column with steph curry in it like you're just going to have a tweet deck column with clay thompson in it and you just have to and you you just like because if you don't you just get run over and like you have to be first the information or you just take limit bets so that's just one example but yeah twitter is the value of the information on twitter is unbelievable and like that there was a period a few months ago where everybody was afraid that uh, Elon was going to pull the plug. And it was, it was like kind of a disaster. You're like, well, how am I going to know who's going to play goalie? Like, how am I going to know all these things? Like I can't even imagine what the sports betting world would be for like the 24 hour period right after, like if Twitter just was gone. hundred percent. It's, it's the biggest edges you'll ever have is getting a piece of information and hitting a book before they adjust to the information. And I, I literally part of like, I'm obviously watching the screens and the markets, but I'm also on Twitter. It's like multiple screen setup because I've got to, I've got to get all that information just, and sometimes it's 12 hours watching a screen for 10 minutes of action. And that 10 minutes of action makes your whole day worth it. Yeah. The Saturday, like the Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, NHL cards that have like 12 to 15 games. My morning is spent. Like we have, we have six monitors at our at our desk. One of them is TweetDeck. Um, you know, just watching the morning skate stuff and then trying to time, like, if I have to pee, like, okay, this coach just spoke about, you know, whatever happened in morning skate, the next morning, like, okay, I have 10 minutes. And then you, like, you kind of get to learn the, the timing of each team's and when they do things and how the beat writers report it. And, yeah, it's – if you, you – you're nothing without Twitter in this industry. I hate to say it, but it's just the yeah. truth. I have a funny story uh, where one bathroom break killed one of the biggest pieces of news that was out there. I it was. Do you remember the week uh, in football where Josh Allen was questionable with the elbow? We didn't know what it, <laughs> what the status was, and yeah. against Minnesota, the line was like leaking from seven and a half down to like three and a half. And it was and it was still total unknown. It's an injury that no one's familiar with, so you can't even make an educated guess at that point. In 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 that three minute window where I went to the bathroom and to grab a drink from the fridge, the news breaks at that moment. Of course, now I, I'm always like resourceful. I'm like, okay, I've lost it. But then you start looking at books that have next week's lines poured ahead because the Buffalo line against Cleveland was misaligned. It was aligned with that uncertainty of Josh Allen. So I was able to move on that, but I missed the boat because the biggest piece of injury information everybody was waiting for, for four days. And I I get caught in the bathroom at that one moment. Yeah. It happens all the time. I mean, you just miss stuff. I mean, you know, in this, in this job, like, when it's busy, I just sit at my desk and like, sometimes you're hungry. Sometimes you got to go to the bathroom. Sometimes you need a water and you got to get up and you try to time it the best of your ability, but you really never know when somebody's going to pick that time to bet 14, make cut. Yes. No. So like all at the same time. So like you never really know what's a good day. You can have an educated guess as to what's a good time to take a five minute break, but you never really know. No. I want to talk about the sharp book model. Um, how long does it take for you guys to identify a sharp better? Like, do you know fairly quickly? Do you wait for a decent enough sample size to determine it? Some people are easy. Some people are harder. Um, the best customer you can have is somebody that wins and doesn't move the screen. Um, those people generally take a little bit longer to realize that they're sharp because the market's not reacting when they play. And a lot of that I would just assume as like every sharp better at one point had no money or very little money for the most part. They have made their money. So like if the guy's betting you a nickel, that might be his, that might be what his bankroll withstands at that current time. That doesn't mean like, yeah. 
you should just disregard every bet that's like two hundred dollars or three hundred dollars. They might have just began their you know journey into sports betting, so to speak, uh, to where they can win because that person might be betting eight hundred next year, twelve hundred. You know, it's just sick. like just judging somebody by their you know how much they're betting just isn't the correct move. So having somebody like that is a is a dream and finding those people are are great and we we do a lot of like we're always looking at player stuff um but then you have somebody that just shows up you've never seen him before in the first three bets uh the whole don best screen turns orange like okay this person knows what they're doing it doesn't take very long to realize so like yeah no two people are the same but some people take longer than others the other challenging part is when you have somebody that like shows up and they're betting something obscure like xfl wnba totals uh, a more niche market and let's say they get hot early you might think they're sharp and then four months later you're like how did this person win all this money like and, and it just turns into a heater so you've got to be like you have to be mindful of people for a while and then eventually like after a few months you can really form an opinion um but any like really anything is possible and you, you you hear it all the time about you know the the sharp guys flipping whales at any point some big better could the stuff could become sharp so you never really know what's going on because there's always people trying to get an edge as best they can so i mean you got to kind of take it case by case some people are easier to figure out than others well we always hear about you know markets moving on sharp action what let's talk about head fakes how often do you think head fakes come in and is it, has it become easier to spot or do you sometimes still get blindsided by a head fake? Um, depends on the sport, honestly. Um, on a Saturday college basketball, I would expect there are like 50 or 60 head fakes a day, maybe more. Um, and it's not even so much a head fake as it is people don't want because they know like what we talked about earlier with PPH's air moving on our moves. So like if we're on an island uh, on a college basketball total number and somebody somewhere doesn't want everybody else to go to our number, they'll bet us the wrong way to keep like to try to keep the market where they want it. Um, that definitely happens. Um, yeah, that it, I mean, they can come from anywhere. They can come from any account. Like it just, it, again, I mean, it's just like anything. The sharp guys know how the market works and they know how the market reacts. And a lot of the times they're just trying to get us or maybe a few other sharp books. Like if they bet us and bet online and Chris or whatever, and we all move, everybody else is going to move. So it might only cost them one bet at each place to get 30 bets everywhere else. Um, so yeah, you just have to be mindful of it and it's hard to, you don't want to overreact to any one bet, but you don't want to, you don't want to ignore it either. Just the more bets you get, the more you can put the pieces together as to like, okay, this, this side is right, or this is the number or whatever the case may be. Yeah. They're very, very frequent in, uh, like the smaller markets that may be, uh, you know, props, things like that. Do you ever move on square action if there's enough volume? I mean, there's always a number, right? Um, a lot of the times it's not so much moving on square action as is moving on unknown action. Like if you're a bookmaker and let's say it's an NBA game, and the number's painted six, it's the middle of the day. There's no, it's, there's no injury questions. It's not a back-to-back -back situation. And some guy you don't know comes in and you give him like a double limit bet on minus six. Like if you don't know, you could leave it because the number seems right. But would you rather move it to six and a half and write a bet back plus six and a half and earn? And then like worst case scenario, you write a bet on both sides with earn. Or would you rather just sit there and then three hours later, somebody sharp comes in and bet you the same number and the number closes seven and a half. You feel like a moron. So like a lot of the times it's better to err on the side of caution. You have no idea if that bet's sharp or square. You just don't know. So like, like don't get killed is the first rule of bookmaking. Um, so like if somebody comes in and bet you 50,000 minus six and your limit is say 20, 
you go to six and a half, somebody bet you 20 plus six and a half, you go back to six. Like they're laying 110 both sides. Like it's perfect. It's great. Um, and you don't feel bad. Like if the number closes five, you don't feel bad about going to six and a half because you've like, you've made some earn on those two bets. You just have to be quick enough to realize when it's going down, not to take too much going down. Um, but yeah, like moving on, like moving on square action, like you have to ask yourself at all times, if I go from this number to that number, I can always take a limit bet at any number. Would I rather have, like if I'm deciding between, do I want to be at six or do I want to be at six and a half? Would I rather take a limit bet minus six or a limit bet plus six and a half? If I had to pick one, what would I choose? And that's kind of how you make that decision. So it sounds like sports books often take a position, but there's that false idea out there that sports books are always looking for balance and just happy to take the juice. Is there ever a case though where that is true? Like say a Super Bowl where the money is huge, way bigger than your normal risk appetite. Is there uh, an attempt for balance and some Super Bowl offerings just because of how large the volume is? Like, yeah, you're the overall general idea of the casinos just trying to balance is like utter nonsense um, because it's not possible, um, first of all. But like if you have like back to your square action moving on square action, let's say you're, you know, you're it's an NFL side. It's game day limits 100,000. If you're at 150,000 in square, if the numbers painted four across the world and you have you take 150,000 in like a cruel of recreational action on minus four. If I go to four and a half and I insta write a hundred thousand plus four and a half from someone with a brain, like, is that good bookmaking? I mean, you've earned to it, but would you rather just book the whole lot at a correct number? Like probably, um, it's very case by case. Like if you can balance the, the game easily as a bookmaker, it's probably not a decision you should be making because you probably have the right side if you can get rid of the other, like if you can dump it. So every, every game is, 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 is of its own ilk. Like, yeah, big Super Bowl. If there's no real sharp money on either side and you don't really know, sometimes it's like really not worth taking a huge gamble. Not really gambling. You're gambling with the best of it because everybody's laying a dollar ten or like betting into a twenty cent split. But I mean, do you want an eight hundred thousand dollar decision or a million and a half decision or whatever the number is, like with no real information as to what side is good or if there's a side? Sometimes not really. Like it's hard. It's it's so case by case. Like certain people bet certain sides. You're like, okay. Players A, B, and C are on this side. Players D, E, and F are on this side. Do we have a side we like here? Can we make a logical move to write something to put ourselves in a better position where we're not scalping or something? Like, everything is, every game is alone in terms of like making a decision. There's no way to like group them together where you can say, okay, this is what we should do. Now, is this an internal dialogue or is there two, three of you huddling together and saying, hey, this game, you know, the volume's starting to come in. What side do we like here? What side do we want to be on? A lot of the times, like, like in sports where there's a specialist, they might have, they might say, like, this number on this game is way too high. I really like the dog in this range of numbers. Um, I, you know, if we write a bet on the dog, be more aggressive so we can write a bet back on the favorite because – it's 17 and a half and I really think it should be 12 um, and you can book accordingly or you get there. It's Sunday. You've written a bunch of bets. It's an NFL game. You're like you might ask somebody else, Hey, you know, we're two and a half limit bets high in this game, but it came from person A, B and C. Do we want to write a bet back or do we want to gamble? And you can talk it out, um, figure out where the numbers, where, where the money is, where you'd have to go to write a bet. And then you're like, you, you just figure out like figure out the best course of action from all of the information that's pre been presented to you, like in the form of bets throughout the week. Sure. I have two scenarios for you. The first one is no matter what side comes out, 
you've made money. And then the second scenario is no matter what side comes out, you lose money. How often does the first one happen and how often does the second one happen? The first one can happen in like smaller limit niche sports. Like, you know, I booked the college baseball. Let's say there's a, you know, you put up the Friday night regular season lines and you see a couple numbers out in the world that just, they're just not good. So I'll hang a number that writes a scalp on the side I want to bet on. And then you move it because you don't really want to take eight or nine. You don't want to take a bunch. You just kind of want to like, I always say as like a bookmaker, your like your opinion is worth one limit bet. It's really not worth more than that. Like maybe once in a great while it could be worth two, but it's really not worth more than one. So you put in, you take that bet, you move it, and then inevitably some sharp guy bet you the bet you the right side, and then you move his bet more aggressively. The market is caught up, and then no one bets it again, and you you know you make fifty, a hundred bucks on each side, and then they bet you a dime or two. Like that happens pretty. That's pretty commonplace. On a bigger event where the limits are five figures. It's just a lot harder for that to happen solely because one limit bet can change your position so much. And, you know, in an NFL Sunday, you're like, okay, we, you know, we only need this side for, you know, a quarter of a limit bet. And then at 101 and 30 seconds, somebody bet you a limit bet, then you move it and then you don't have enough time to write something back. So like that happens. So that the smaller the limits, the more likely that is to happen. And that would be the same it's kind of the same answer for the other one where you lose on both sides. Um, just because once you've written enough volume, the juice accrues and it's like really hard to like continue to scalp yourself over a series of limit bets. Um, Cause once you get later in the week, the line really can only move so much. So if you want to, you want to earn, you can, um, it would be kind of like a reverse scenario of what I just said, where, you know, there's some niche market where a sharp guy makes you a bet and you you weren't confident in the price. So maybe you make a bigger move than normal um, to write something on the other side to where like somebody bet you a dime plus a dollar 40, but you really have no confidence in the number at all. And maybe you go to minus 130 to write a bet on the other side because you think losing a hundred dollars on one side and breaking even on the other is better than losing the thousand, like more often than not. Um, like sometimes caution is the better part of valor when you have no confidence in the number, like it all comes back to don't get killed. Um, so yeah, it happens, but really only in like smaller limit niche sports where there aren't nearly as many number of bets. What about like say an information changer like you know denver new orleans a few years ago in covid the the news that the whole qb room has covid and they can't play and maybe you get a bunch of people clicking for the limit on new orleans and then when you reopen it you don't know where the hell you are and maybe they say no you've, you've gone way too far and they hit you the other way is there scenarios like that where you're just like damn it, we just it is what it is there's nothing we can do about that yeah, that, I mean, that stuff you, you can't do. You kind of like all the bets that have come in before, like a surprise news, you almost have to like forget they're there. You got to just throw it out, new game, start over. It is what it is. The bet has been made. The one that I can think of that's best example of that, a couple of years ago, it was unsure if Tiger was going to play in the Masters like right up until like the day before. And we thought it was a good idea for marketing Let's put up this, will Tiger Woods tee off in the Masters? Yes, no. Take a dime, take two dimes, whatever we took. Um, but because it's it's like almost like booking a draft in that, it's what I like to call a no variance event. Like if you bet the Chiefs minus 10 and then, you know, Pat Mahomes breaks his leg falling down the stairs, like leaving his house on Sunday morning and the game goes to pick him, you can still win your bet. Like in these, in these drafts or in these, there's no, what's going to happen happens. So like if somebody with a brain bets you minus $2, the move is like minus $8, not minus 240, because they might know, they might have the answer already and you have no idea. So booking those is 
it's not fun at all um, because you think no, you get no recreational action and you have to assume every single bet is a winner. Um, so you're going from like $2 to $8 to $5 to $3 to $9. Like, so you're just going to get killed. Like, cause they're just, you're giving away so much earn every time, but you're kind of locking up an eight or a $10,000 loss. So you don't lose 80,000. Um, and what you get in publicity for it, like it pays for like what you lose to it. Um, sure. but yeah, that kind of event, you kind of have to disregard the logic of bookmaking, the things that are so information driven, like booking drafts is, it's so bad. Um, yeah, I, I know it's so, it's so, it's so, it's so good. It's so so good bad. on my as end. A, as, of course. Like, cause it's all information. And like, we were talking about this in the office the other day, like we haven't booked the NBA draft in a couple of years, but if we were going to book an, the NBA draft, you need to have three people that all they do all week is the NBA draft and they don't look at anything. And one of them has to be awakened on Twitter at all times. And then when you see news, you have to move it. And you have to beat people. And it can't matter where the bets were. You just have to be right. And you're like, okay, this player that maybe wasn't thought that he was going to get drafted here is now very likely. So he goes from like plus 140 to minus $4 and you just have to move it and write the bets on the other side and hope you're right. It's just a race to information. And as a bookmaker, like it kind of sucks, but you know, NFL draft is a necessary evil. Like as the bookmaker, it's just too popular to not book, but something like the NBA draft, like sometimes it's just best. Like it's, what do you gain from booking it as the bookmaker? Yeah. I have two more questions for you before I let you go. And you've been so generous with your time. Um, there's often the idea that, you know, locals love to bet the local team. And it doesn't matter if they're getting the worst price in market. They're always going to bet their local teams. So I always joke. I have uh, some people I know who book in here in Toronto. They're very happy that Toronto is a losing sports city. And then you think of like the bookies in Boston who – the last 20 years have been booking like Patriots, uh, the Celtics, the Bruins, the Red Sox. Basically, everybody's won a championship. Vegas just won the Stanley Cup. Is it the same sentiment of locals love their local team? And and was it like, you know what, we, we took a little bit of a hit here? Yeah, I mean, it was. And like, there's two examples of that. So the first year they were here, it was very widely noted how bad of shape the books were in. I worked at Caesars at the time. Caesars had very little local presence at that point. Like they just got mobile betting. Like there was nowhere to sign up off the strip. So the only local action you got was like either sharp stuff, or maybe you got somebody that worked at the casino next door that would walk in and sign up for an app so they could bet. But there was no, there really wasn't a lot of local stuff. So while everybody else was buried, we actually only lost like a really small amount to that at Caesars because we had so much tourist stuff and people wanted to come in and bet their teams, like all the tourists that were there to visit. So they were actually, it, we actually won to them quite a bit during that year. But this year, yes, spot on uh, going into the Stanley Cup playoffs. We only lost to two teams and that was one of them. Um, plus, and it's not only the futures, you lose every night. Now, you can write a bet like in a market like that, if you want to write a bet back, it's pretty easy to write a bet back. So if you don't, if you get uncomfortable with your risk position, you can always move the number a few pennies and write a limit bet. And so anybody who cries about how much money they lose to the individual games, like you're just not doing your job good enough. Now, you can make the decision that, and say, this is all recreational money. I want to gamble to this. Because it's like your educated decision as a bookmaker that, you know, they're betting a market number. The number hasn't moved. We should book this. But again, there's always a risk number with what you're tolerant of. But then you take a look at Circa. I mean, Circa Sportsbook is an incredible place and the Circa Casino is an incredible place. So even though we're losing money in the sportsbook, uh, you know, pretty much every night that Vegas played during the playoffs, plus, you know, the futures, Yep. The sports book is absolutely jam packed with fans and it's great for business and it's great for the casino. And while yes, we lost some money, it, 
it really wasn't all that bad given the return of, you know, the casino is full for every single one of these games. All right. One last question, Jeff. Uh, we talked about the art of bookmaking and taking bets and moving your positions. I saved it for the end because I'm not sure if you'll give me the secret sauce here, but how do you guys set your initial lines? I know with pro bettors, they'll have models and they'll create what they believe is a fair line. Do you guys do the same? Do you guys have modelers and create your own line? Because Circa is often the first to line line a sport. I remember with the XFL, you guys were like 15, 18 hours before anybody else with a pulse showed up. How do you guys set your lines? I think it differs sport by sport. Like you look at, it's clear we're making our own numbers in a college football because we're first to the screen on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. every you know, every week with sides and totals. So it's clear. Um, the best thing is, is I, you never really know. Like one year, the first year I was there, I tried to open hockey first and then like bet online. And like, I think I want to say like Barstool was like going, they started going like two days in advance. I'm like, well, this is stupid. So I stopped doing that. And like, sometimes like, let's say the hockey I'm choosing what we hang every day. And sometimes some places are up sometimes more than others, but nobody's going to know if I'm in the office that day. So like somebody might hang a number and it might have nothing to do with anything. It might just be what they put in. So like, is there like a secret sauce? No, it varies. It varies by day. It varies by sport. Um, Sometimes like, the hockey's a real grind because it's every single day for, you know, eight months, nine months. Some days I'm just, you know, I got to do something with my wife and kid. I'm taking them to dinner. I'm going out with the in law whatever it is. I don't have time to go through tomorrow's overnights and look and see like, okay, this team's on a back-to-back. This goal is probably going to play. This guy missed last game. Sometimes I just don't have time and I'll just be like, just hang what you see. Um, if somebody has an opinion, throw it in. Like, and then I f- wake up in the morning, I figure it out. And maybe I put the numbers where I want them. Maybe they already are where they want them. So there's really no, it's different. It, I mean, you, people might think it's like, oh, we're the sharpest sports book in the world. Half the time we're just winging it on the, on the openers. Like we, the closers are pretty good, I would think, but like the openers don't matter when you're taking three, two, three dimes to the openers and 20, 30, 50 dimes to the closers, the openers, it just, like they matter, but they don't matter. Yeah. In fact, you don't mind if uh, a sharp better comes in for cheap and gives you some of his information and says, here's what the line should be. And you're like, thank you, price discovery. We'll get yeah. to where we need to be for cheap. Yeah. And like, yeah, you got to be careful. Like th- that's when the fakes come a lot of the times because they want you to, especially the fakes come when you're the only person on the screen or like maybe there's only one or two books on the screen because they know everybody just copies what one person has. And that's why like, it's why the college baseball is so good because one place that really doesn't know what they're doing will be first. And then everyone copies. And it's like, like last night's, I don't know how much college baseball you follow, but last night's college baseball total opener was in the discussion for worst opener in any sport and any total, like outside of maybe the circus sports WNBA Olympic team total. Um, I mean, and then everyone copies like they the same two teams faced the night before and it closed like 9.25. And then last night, the two best pitchers in the country were facing each other. The wind was blowing in and somebody hung 11 and then everyone copied. And it's just like, I, if you have a pulse that you can't possibly have hung it any higher than it closed the night before. Um, so it closed like eight under, which, you know, made sense, but it, it's, it's not just in that sport. It's in any sport. Cause like somebody hangs a number and then everyone copies and you just, a lot of the times you get lucky with a bad number that gets copied. What was that game in uh, Mexico or uh, they, they opened it like uh 12 or 13 and ended up closing like 16, 17 and still wasn't enough. They ended up scoring like 30 combined runs. And then the next oh, day was that was the like Padres 17. game, like a couple yeah, months the, ago. Yeah. Closed yeah. like 20 and it opened like 12 and a half, 13. Yeah. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was, yeah. It's insane. Yeah. You just, you know, sometimes you hang a bad number. Nobody's immune. 
I can't tell you how many times I've hung a hockey number and gone, oh, no, they played. This is their third game in four nights, and I didn't realize. And then you just – you throw away a bet because you don't yeah. realize, and it's like 15, 20 cents off, and you're like, oh, no. Like, it happens all the time. Perfect. Jeff, you've been so gracious with your time. I want to thank you for joining me. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, happy to help. All right, that's it for me. Another edition of 90 Degrees is in the books. I want to thank my guest, Jeff Davis, assistant sportsbook manager at Circus Sports, and my producer, Jason Cooper, who is like my right-hand man around here. Thanks for listening. Do me a favor. Before you go, like the content, subscribe, share, and comment. We'll be back next week with another guest on the 90 Degrees podcast where we give an inside look into the sports betting industry. That's it for me. Hope you enjoyed. Until next time.